Hey guys, in today's video, what we're going to do is kind of see if we can wrap up this project on this uh, General Electric Model 875. Here it is in white, by the way. It also came in, I think, maybe red or pink or whatever, but ours is in a nice mahogany brown. And what we're going to do in this episode is we're mainly going to be dealing with the power system that we're going to have in this. We're going to make some modifications to the power system in this uh, radio and then install it into the, uh, into the board itself. So, uh, will look like that. But anyway, then we'll clean this thing up and see how it looks and put it through some tests and see how it does and uh, we'll see how it goes. So up in the upper right hand corner up here at the beginning of all these videos is a, a, a card that will send you to the playlist of the videos in this series and then at the bottom of all of these either down at the bottom of the play bar, bar or down in the comments in the pin note will be the timestamps that you can jump to different parts of the video uh, so if you're interested in a particular car part or you want to see it again, you can jump back to it. So have a look at that if you'd like to. So without any further ado, let's get started into part five. Alright guys, thanks for watching. This thing's all basically fixed and uh, we'll work on the case next. So thanks and see you next episode. Put the unit back over there on the other side of the shop where it can cool down and not get into trouble. Okay, so one of the things we're going to be doing is we're going to be putting in a fuse. Uh, since I don't really have a place to have a chassis to attach a fuse holder, I'm going to end up using one of these things right here. So I'll use this. I'll cut into the power line and add this fuse holder in there. And like I say, I'll probably put in either a a half amp or a three eighths amp, probably half amp fuse in there, and then that'll fuse it, and it'll just be kind of laying in here, uh, out of the way. One of the uh, one of the questions that I've had is, what am I going to do about the power? Okay, so what did I do with the back? Okay, so I get to looking at the back panel on this, and this has one of those inner you know interconnects, all right, and this was really really stiff, and so. Last night, after the bumblebee blew up, blew up, I got to thinking, is this thing going to crack or anything? And so I started doing this, and it wasn't cracking. And what was interesting is, the more I did this, the more flexible it got. So I went down this whole thing and just kind of flexing it while I was letting the thing play to make sure it didn't have any other problems. And this thing's limbered up quite a bit, and it's not cracking. So I wonder if maybe you just kind of work this thing back and forth, and maybe the cord's okay. So now let's think about this. Okay, now everybody would probably disagree with me on this, but some people might agree. This has a, an interlock, okay? It was even UL approved at the time. It has an interlock to prevent you from getting shocked if you take the back off. It disconnects the power to the chassis right here. Okay, so let's talk about this a minute. This isn't really a hot chassis radio. I said it was earlier because schematically it would be, but there is no chassis on this radio. It's just a circuit board and there's a there's a ground line that runs around. It's really the B minus that then returns back. So the screws are all isolated. There's not even screws on the bottom to touch. So the entire thing is insulated all the way around it. So I got to thinking, well, maybe the important thing is is to put a fuse in, okay, before you get to the switch. And you put in a safety capacitor, which I've done, and then maybe that's it. And you leave this like it has. And so you say, okay, what's wrong with that? All right, so what's wrong with that is, is that this can be plugged in to where either the switch gets the neutral or the switch gets the hot. So I don't think there's anything you can touch that would connect you to this on the outside. And if you take the back off, it interrupts the power. So it's kind of safe. If I were to do something else, like cut this off and put another plug in and all of that, then you could take the back off this radio and still have power connected to it. I don't know. I mean, I just feel like maybe the factory, original design, approved design, even though it was in the 50s, was it had this interconnect. I think I'm going to leave it. And I'm going to leave the cords since it seems to be okay. And then in terms of what's going on here, in terms of who's getting the, the neutral and who's getting the hot, 
I think what I'll do is I'll put the fuse between the switch and the plug. So I'll put it on this leg here. So that if something goes wrong, it'll blow here before you get to the switch. Let's see, if hot comes this way, then at least it has to go through the filament string and the rectifier and all the thing else before it can get to anywhere else. And if this is off, then maybe that'll be okay. If the fuse goes, uh, there won't be any way for this to get continuity. It's not going through the chassis because there is no chassis. Anyway, I, I'm going to give it some more thought, but I think that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to put a fuse between the plug and the switch. I've got a safety capacitor here, and then I think I'm going to leave the rest of it alone. All right, I'd like to clean this case up. It's got full of junk, and part of it's full of uh, old uh, bumblebee capacitor, too, that blew out. So I'm going to see if I can get the speaker out here. And this has got some interesting little clips. I'm actually using the television here so I can see. I'm going to see if I can get those things out without destroying things. It should be nice if that other thing went down through far enough for you just put a pair of pliers on it and open it up, but the tang didn't go all the way through. Okay. Here it looks like, so what's the big deal, right? Put some pliers on that and squeeze it to where that opens it up. Well, what happens is, is that when you look in there, that's already closed up. It's already like, it's already like that. Focus. It's already like that. So what I had to do was go in with a blade and pry. Like I said, this this is back even with those other tangs. So you had to go in there and pry in between, twist the blade, and then slide, you know, kind of wobble this thing out. All right, let me get the other three out. You don't need to watch it. Maybe I'll show the fourth one because by that time it'd be real good, right? Anyway, that's one of them. Now I'm starting to look like I know what I'm doing, huh? Now you can kind of see how I ended up having to do that. Now you can't. <laughs> All right, that's two down. Let's see if I can make them all that easy. Huh? Okay. There we are. You see that, right? That's how I had to get them out, was to do that kind of that kind of maneuver. All right. So let's take a look at the speaker here. Terminals are at the top. The speaker looks okay. It's got some of that white stuff on it. It's got a few critters that were living in there. I'll try to get all that out of there. See if we can poke a hole in the whole thing. Okay. All right, I want to take a little bit of time to get this cleaned up. Um, I'll take these off and maybe make some better leads for going to the uh, audio output transformer. Clean off some of this rust that's on here. But basically, yeah, I think it looks okay. As for what that white stuff is, I don't know, it looks like it might scrape off. But, anyway. Okay, I'll get this uh, get this cleaned up. I'll clean out the uh, inside of the cabinet. Give that a, give that a cleaning. I like how they put the tape over one of the biggest scratches so you wouldn't know that's what you're getting. <laughs> All right. Okay, so here's the results after uh, a bath, just to wash off the dirt. And so we got all the, the dirt out. This is this has got a really rough surface. I'm not sure what it is. I think it's just the way it was molded or something got sprayed in there. It's like it got wiped off at one point here. 
No idea. It's a rough, coarse sort of thing. It's not not dirt though and dust. The rest of it, uh, rest of it cleaned up. The area that people haven't been messing with is not too bad, but you know, it's you know, it's, it's kind of low piece of equipment. There's something here is kind of probably a chemical melt, and you see it's kind of faded and hazy in places. So we'll see what we can do about that. But you know. Hey, what do you want? It's clean. It's a little bit better. They have a formulation that is coarser than that, which is known as three. Let's give that a try. Now this says for heavy scratch. So I put this on and then I'll have to follow it up with Novus 2. And we'll see what we get. The nose too does a good job of getting the uh, dull haze off. I don't expect this to go in there and grind away at the really deep scratches, but maybe I'll make some of the smaller scratches kind of fade out a bit more. The purpose of that was kind of to even out the scratches. And I'll switch back to Novus too. So I went with the two first to see whether I needed to do the three at all. Eh, it looked like I need I didn't need two on the top, but we'll see. I'll probably do that a little bit more. Depends on how much you want to do it, but you can see it's it's done some good. This part here, from here to here, has not been polished. And you know, just make it look as best as we can, right? It's like a mirror, right? All right, I'm gonna keep working on this a little bit. Okay, this is a status update. So I've done the. Uh, the tops, the sides. Okay, pretty good. I actually, did a little bit on the bottom too. Uh, and then the face, <clears throat> I've started doing the louvers, and I've done these here, and I haven't done these yet. So you can kind of see the difference of what you know cleaning the plastic does. And then I also haven't done this yet either. You can tell, but I've done the bezel around here. They don't really show up that great on the camera, but uh, it's looking pretty pretty decent for its age. In here in the little corners and stuff, you know, I'll probably have to get another Q-tip or something. I'll, I'll carry it to a certain extent, but not much more than that, but it'll end up looking pretty good when we get done. So anyway, I'll bring you back after I've done anything more of any substance. Okay, cleaning of the uh, cabinets done. Uh, it looks pretty good. What do you think? Not too bad. What do you think? You think we ought to take a look at the dial? The the dial that we dial? Take a look at that.
kind of see its transparency there. Okay, give this a quick clean and see how, how it turns out. I'm going to take it a little easy on the back because that's where these markings are attached or painted or whatever. And I don't think this is where most of the, the dirt is. This was kind of a protected area back here. Okay. Alright, there we go. I think that looks better. How's that going to look when I put it on here? Well, that's starting to look kind of classy, huh? Alright. Before. Three minutes later. Yeah, I think that looks better. That'll look pretty good. We get this back on here. Right, because it's, it's, it's enough being the good guy. Now is when you say, okay, I've been here, you're doing this. Now I want out, and now you're going to make it happen for me. Well, it's and like then all the, you got to put the pressure on him to do it. It's like all the NBA uh, NFL stars we've been talking about for years. Right, you can't be the good guy all the time. At some point, you're going to have to take the blow back. Because I don't know... I swear to you, I don't know why, but on coast to coast AM. Okay, so this has been, uh, been kind of fun to see what this thing would look like outside of the case because it's probably not ever going to come back out of this case again. Alright, so I'm ready to start doing the wiring and start putting this all back together again. So let me get the power off and uh, I'm going to go over what I've decided to do about the power uh, hooking it all up. Okay, so you can see this okay. So you remember we talked about doing the uh, doing the switch here. One of the things I was concerned about was I had said, well, if this goes straight to hot, is there anything that can be touched that would have any communication to anything you could, you know, to any of this? So what I did was is that I had this thing running, okay, and I hooked up, now this has been on an isolation transformer, right? But what I did was I hooked up a voltmeter while this was running to each of these two posts individually and tested for any kind of uh, voltage to this right here in case somebody pulled this knob off and they put their finger in there to see whether that would get them a jolt if the hot went straight to it. So what I did was is I measured the voltage between here and either one of these leads because in the real world that might end up being neutral, right? And to see if I would get any any uh, voltage there. This was always reading a little bit of voltage, just that phantom voltage sort of thing. So I have another meter that has a, a, a low Z uh, check on it, a low impedance check, and I did the low impedance check for both of those and got zero volts. So anyway, that's what I did. So I'm confident that this is not going to be touching even if hot went directly to this from here. There wasn't any connection through to that to that knob. It's not grounded. All right. Okay, so what we talked about doing is we're going to put the switch on this lead, sorry, the fuse on this lead right here. And I'm going to do that. The other thing I want to do though is I want to install an inrush thermistor on here, an inrush limiter. And what I like to use is I have some uh, CL90s for my uh, tube equipment. And uh, these will these will take up to two amps. So that's plenty for what this is. This thing wants maybe three quarters, not three quarters, three eighths of an amp. So uh, this this will be plenty. It will also drop the voltage a bit. 
because this was designed for like 117 and I'm currently running about 123 at the house so this would drop the, the voltage down so that plus limiting the inrush will help save these tubes and save this radio and uh, the fuse of course will be put in with one of these. I wish I could do something like I normally do which is these okay but I just don't have a place to attach it other than drilling a hole in the case and I just don't want to do that so hey if anybody wants to to put this in on their own they can do it but meanwhile I'm going to put this in it's not certainly not irreversible okay so I'll put that in now, the question is, is where to mount the thermistor all right so there really isn't a good place to mount it I don't really want to have you know wires being pulled or anything like that so let me get this out of the way all right, so we got one lead that's going to go to the switch. That's this one. I'm going to install the fuse on that leg. All right. I want to put the thermistor. I could put it on that leg or I could put it on this leg. Uh, I think what I'm going to do, you see how this little guy is just floating on a little board and then it kind of screws into this screw location right here. So you have just a little board stuck in with a screw that has wires going to it. And that's how this thing was designed. That's where the interlock plugs in and out. So I think what I want to do is I'm going to get one of these terminal strips. You see I'm holding it with a pair of uh, these clamps. I'm going to take that center lug and fold it down out of the way. I'm going to mount the thermistor in between the two outer legs. Okay. And I'm going to have this green lead come into one, go through the thermistor, and come out the other side, and then go into the board. Okay. Now where am I going to mount that? Well, I think what I'm going to do is similar to the way this was done. I'm going to put it underneath that screw right there. I've checked out inside of the case. Okay, I'll leave that in too. All right, so then this goes in here like this. And there's some space up there, right up in here, where I want to put that little terminal strip. Can you see it? It's right there. So this will fit in here like that. And there's plenty of space for the thermistor to have uh, heat around it because it gets hot. And uh, so it has plenty of air area around through here, and so that'll be fine. The, uh, the really hot tubes are down here a bit of ways from it, so I think it'll be all right. So that's the plan for that. I'm not going to show soldering all this. I'll, I'll bring you back when I get all that done, and then uh, that'll be our power setup. Okay, the power work is done. What I've done is I went in and uh, let me see if I find something to part with. I rewired both wires that went into the chassis from this right here because they've been moving around and where they were connected to the switch and back here to the board I just felt like they've been flexed a lot of times and so I wanted to just replace replace these two leads so I took the opportunity since I was putting in this fuse holder anyway to change both the wires that went to this front plug so here this lead now connects to the fuse I don't have the fuse in there right now but you might be able to see it suspended in there where it won't be near the speaker and it won't hit the case and tap or anything and uh, this lead comes down uh, and it connects directly to the switch uh, I don't know if you can see it but it's right in there you get a better look at it later because I'm going to be taking this back out in a minute so that goes to the switch so there's the fuse to the switch connection okay now the other one which is the other lead which is originally green came over here and went straight to the board uh, over here so what it did was is I unsoldered this, re-terminated the connection to the board so it had not been flexed back and forth a number of times. And then here is that CL90 thermistor that you can see in there. So there's the there's the CL90 and it's attached to a little barrier strip down there or a, you know what to call it. And that it's held in by the screw that holds the circuit board into the case. Okay, so power comes in, this green line comes to here, goes through the thermistor, and then goes the rest of the way to the board. 
So where that is schematically is here's where the fuse is now. This is now the red lead and that's where the fuse is and the green lead comes over to here and I broke this line right here and installed the thermistor right there so the thermistor is there now. Okay, So it'll look like uh, let me find a pencil. Now this comes in instead of having this line instead of having this line here now I've installed a thermistor here. I'll put an X on that. And we've now installed a a fuse. Okay, so this is what we got now. We got a fuse here, broke this line and put a thermistor here, a CL90. And so now we've got it set the way we had intended to set up. Okay, so I just put this in here to make sure it would all fit. And now what I'm going to do is wire these up to the speaker. Now where the speaker was connected, somebody had tried to make little slip-on lugs to go onto the speaker. Okay, I think you had noticed I've cleaned the white stuff off the speaker. And as much rust as I felt like doing it, was, you know, it's not active. Okay, but somebody had taken like a, I guess a, it looked like a, a pin socket, a socket from the underside of a, of a tube socket, snapped it off and twisted it into kind of a, a little loop here to try to make it into a connection. I think attach the wire to and slide it onto the connection as a speaker. Well, it obviously didn't work very well because they later went in there and just soldered it all in one place. In fact, this one's still on there. Okay, so what I need to do is hook up a connection between these and these two speaker leads. And these are just too short. I'm probably just going to put on little pigtails and go the rest of the way. Um, I mean, they're not, they're not, certainly not any kind of high voltage or anything, but I just don't want to make these so twisted and pulled so hard. It makes it more difficult to get this out of the case too. So I just rig up a couple of jumpers from here and I will go ahead and solder it in. It's not like someone's going to be in and out of this very often. Okay, so I've had some really bad news that I'm going to have to deal with. I noticed it when I was test fitting the, uh, the board back into here and attaching the uh, power connection here. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but the plastic is cracked. There is a fine crack right there. Looks like there's another one here on top. I don't know about this side, but this this boss has cracked from being over tightened, it looks like. And I got to look at some of these other ones, and this one, which I haven't even used other than the first time I, you know, I mean, I just opened this up. I haven't even put another screw back into there. I like the power connection. And this one's cracked, too. Looks like to me. Let's see. Yeah, there's a crack there that runs up through there. And there's a fine crack here. I don't see one on this one here. Uh, now, as far as the bosses back here that the circuit board is held in with, this one's got some chipping on it. I can't tell if it's correct or not. Alright, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to figure out a way to reinforce these things. I have a type of plastic cement that's called plastic surgery. I might try to put on that. Uh, I just don't know. This one looks like it's stripped out some. Uh, so I'm going to try to put a little bit of that on here and see if that looks like it'll adhere to this plastic and whether or not um, that'll work. Otherwise I'm going to have to get creative. But anyway, okay. Just another unexpected wrinkle there. Never mind the neighbor's lawnmower going. Okay, so we use this stuff right here. It's basically super glue. It's got a couple of different types of cyanacrylate in here. It contains ethyl cyanacrylates, polymethyl, meth, 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 
<laughs> methacrylate. All right. So what I did with these is I just went in and put a little bit on the crack and just kind of squeezed it together as best I could. And uh, hopefully, if, hopefully maybe it'll just reinforce the crack, to keep it from spreading. I may, I may stick a small thin sliver of wood in there to see if that'll help tighten it up if I need it. Anyway, we'll put the speaker back in now. So yeah, by the way, I went through the speaker. I did not try to get the white stuff off the cut off the paper. It looked like it was like dried up. Uh, I don't know, Ajax cleaner or Comet or something like that. It's kind of a, an abrasive. It feels like. Uh, but anyway, I got it off of the metal bits. I just used a stiff brush, uh, plastic brush, to go in there and scrub it off. I went after the rust a little bit, but it's just not really worth dealing with, and I didn't want to mess with it too much. Uh, so I've got some extension leads soldered onto the uh, leads coming from the radio. And so I'll go ahead and put the, here they are. So I'll put the speaker back in, then put the chassis back in, well, such as it is, put this back in, and then wire these in, and then put the back on, we'll be finished. We'll have to see how the screws turn out, but I'm, I'm not going to tighten them down too tight. Okay, so the speaker is just about in. I've been putting these, uh, these terrible little clips in there. And uh, so I've, I did three of them to hopefully get better. And so then I thought I'd show you how I did how I did them on the fourth one. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to get this in this shot or not. So the trick is, let me see if I can show you here the issue. Okay, the issue is, right, so you got these little ears, right? So normally you would take a pair of pliers, right, and kind of close the ears like this. Right, and that would open up the the circumference to where you could slide this down the post and just release it. Well, no, the post is too big around. It won't actually it won't actually open up enough to go into the post using just this. So they must have had a special shaped jaw in there to go in there and push that other one a little bit further forward. I don't have that. Uh, I was going to grind up something, but you know I managed to get it on there, so I'm not going to bother making a tool for it. But I do start with this. Now, first I thought what I needed is a mandrel to make it to where I could open these up wider. So I took one of these step drills and I tried setting it in here to see if I could use that as a mandrel to try to get it open and then prop it open. I just couldn't, I don't have the right size on here. I could probably experiment with it, but I found another way to get it to work. All right, so what I'm going to do is I want to start with this and get it started, okay? I did think about sticking a little something in there to provide a little bit more of a pinch, like a piece of uh, insulation. It didn't really help that much. Okay, so you try to get this started. Try not to poke a hole through the speaker, right? I keep telling myself that. Okay. And that's got it started. So what it does is it goes ahead and kind of gets the ears kind of close together already because it kind of gets you on the way. All right, let's see if I can get it to go down any further. So what I'm doing is I'm just trying to squeeze as best I can with just a pair of pliers and then maybe just kind of pushing down on the top see if I can get it to kind of start or at least get as far as I can get it to go using this method. Okay, that's about as far as I can get it. <coughs> okay, so what I'm left with is, is that the ears, which are right here, are pretty close together. Now what I'm going to do is, as I got these out, so I'm going to shove the screwdriver down in there and then turn it to where it'll be looser. I had to kind of use the post to get this started because otherwise you really can't you really can't work the, the screwdriver in, in between those ears. You kind of have to go this way and that way. And that's what you want to end up with. But you can't really do that from this side without twisting everything all out of position. So this gets it kind of more or less and now you can kind of get in there. Alright, I don't know if you can see what I'm going to do, but I'll try my best. 
and you kind of work yourself beside the post to pain in the neck, huh? Okay. Pretty close. Twist it to make them open up. And gently push down with something. And we're about home. God, you can't see it. That's down. And that's down. So now I'm just going to hold that in place while I disengage this guy. And the speaker is in. All right. And uh, yeah, just because it's a thing on the frame of the speaker on the other side, I signed my name and dated it. One day a tech may find that, but I very much doubt it. <laughs> All right. So now we finished putting the rest of the case in. Got to put the uh, dial on with the uh, retainer first. That was a fun little fight, but I got this all put back in. I got the, uh, you can see the uh, thermistor is here. I just need to solder on the leads to the speaker. I need to put the fuse in the fuse holder. The uh, the glue seems to have held. I didn't I didn't I didn't really press my luck, but I've got it on there nice and snug, so that'll hold it just fine. And uh, I've got everything else in place on this. Uh, I don't know if it was always that way or not, to be honest. If I push on it, it kind of helps a little bit, but it could be the face has got a little bit of a bow to it. I don't know, but uh, it, it works. So, and I got this put back on too. It's looking pretty good. All right, these uh, two leads to the speaker and get the fuse in and we'll see how she does. These are back on. And might do just a little bit of dressing here of some of the leads, but uh, generally they look like they're going to be just fine. Okay. Grab that uh, fuse I wanted to use. Let's see, where is it? Okay. And I come out of half amp, so I've got some three eighths slow blow. That'll be fine. If I need to go to half amp. I probably got another problem. I have to find out what it is with that uh, CL90 in there. I wouldn't be surprised if I have a problem because it'll be it'll be definitely controlling the inrush. Okay. Sure. Yep, 375 milliamps. Okay, we got the back. Last look. Looks okay to me. It's pushed into a slot up here at the top. So, like that. And then just push firmly down to make up the interlock. It's made up. Lose the screws? <laughs> no. <laughs> I found one. Should be another one somewhere. 
Is there another one here somewhere? It's here somewhere. I'll find it. So that one's on. That's here somewhere. There's always a screw missing, right? All right, so let's, should we go straight to the mains? Now I've done some power work, so let's go into uh, to the isolation transformer just to make sure we don't have a short so I can have uh, the advantage of the uh, dim bulb. All right, so now, My power panel. All right. Okay. Switch is off. Bulb is in the so in the circuit. Turn voltage up. Mister should be heating up. So we're getting current draw. No current draw. Maybe if I plug it in. There we go. Let's draw voltage now. And we're at 17, 18 watts. Let's clean this plug. It's got uh, it's got some crud on it. Let's just get this cleaned up and we'll see if that improves things some. That's a brass brush. Alright. That looks a little bit cleaner. But it doesn't even better. Stuff is perishable anyway, but it's time, you know, to prepare. 
Preparedness is not for, you know, weirdos. Kindly quality about him. It's at least... Well, folks, there you have it. I think it looks quite a bit better than it did when we first brought this thing in. Um, here's a here's a view of what it looked like when we first got it. Hey, guys! So welcome back. All right, let's uh, let's go back to an old radio here. This is uh, a General Electric, and it's a model. 875. I've done just a little bit of research on this. This is from like around 1956, 1957, somewhere in that time frame. If I find the date code inside, uh, we'll, we'll see if we can spot it. Uh, I haven't had this open yet. I picked this up at an auction. There's the tag number. I don't remember what I paid for it. Probably a couple of bucks. This is uh, all plastic. This is not Bakelite. This is plastic. And it's got a on-off control. And moves like this. It's got civil defense markings here. Back when we had civil defense channels. And here's a view of it now. I think it looks uh, like a lot better. What do you think? Uh, it's 65 years old. It's going to look like it looks. But uh, at least it's cleaned up nice. I think that the dial and everything looks really sharp on it. And uh, let's see. How does it sound? Well, here's how it used to sound. So it seems to be picking up pretty well. Well, this started off to be, quite honestly, something that was going to be meant to be a fairly quick, quick fix. You know, just going to maybe find some bad filter caps, um, maybe do a little bit of alignment on it, uh, just check for maybe a, a bad capacitor for the audio coupling capacitor, and uh, maybe a quick alignment, and this thing will be finished, you know, hoping that I didn't run into a problem like silver mica disease. Well, it turned out to have a bad case of silver mica disease. And so I was left with the decision of, do I just chuck it? And because it was making it totally incapable of working. And instead, because it was like, well, why not? You know, uh, let's go for it. So we, we tackled the silver mica disease. I think it was pretty clear from looking at what it took to document that work to take care of the mica, the silver migration on the mica, that that explains why a lot of people throw these things out. But, you know, if you got a radio that you really want to keep a keepsake or something like that and you need to do something like you know fixing the IF cans and then that tells you uh, what's necessary to do it and as a result we ended up with this little guy um, at the end so yeah it started off as being something that was just going to be something I was going to buy for a couple of bucks fix and hey here here's a radio for you and here's what it took to get it going and to now something that's like man you know, hopefully they enjoy this because you can just see how many hours and hours and hours of work went into this. It's not perfect. It looks 65 years old, but it plays and it works okay. Right up, and uh, by the way, here it is plugged in, not through the isolation transformer, but right into the house house current. So, looks like we just had a dirty plug. All right, guys. Thanks a lot for watching this. Watch this episode. It's been uh, it's been an interesting journey on this one. I'll find that other screw around here somewhere and get it into the back. So anyway, thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. And look what I found on the floor. Didn't lose them. By the way, in case you've been wondering, what in the heck is that beep? That's this. <laughs> 
this, this guy right here telling me he's powering down to save his battery. <laughs> he's been doing it all, all video long. Nice and snug. That uh, glue seemed to work pretty good. Okay. Now she's finished, guys. Thanks. Combat the unhealthy lifestyle that seems to permeate throughout America. Balance of Nature takes a nutritious blend of 31 different fruits and vegetables, puts them through an advanced cold vacuum process, grinds them up.